Hello and welcome to Art Appreciation Online. My name is Ron Ramsey, I'm the Executive Director of the Art Gallery Society of New South Wales and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Domain Theatre at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Of course the gallery is on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people, of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past and present and emerging. Today we're going to be talking about Anibale Karachi and the loves of the gods, myths, marriage and mischief, and who better to present it than Lorraine Kipiotis. Thank you, Ron, for that great introduction. And it's nice to know that in these turbulent times there is some consistency. Thank you, Art Gallery of New South Wales. Well, let's find out a little bit more about the loves of the gods, the myth, the marriage aspects, and the mischief in the Farnese Gallery. It was actually in 1597 that Anibale Caracci was commissioned by the Cardinal Eduardo Farnese to paint the ceiling of his Roman palazzo. It was actually his sculpture gallery. The resultant masterpiece depicted the loves of the gods and seemingly celebrated love triumphant. Yet on closer inspection, the stories are concerned with the often turbulent, erotic, and at times frivolous nature of the dalliances of the gods and goddesses and the objects of their passions. The vault decoration was the outstanding achievement of Anibale Karachi's career. Bellori, who was a 17th century biographer, in his Lives of the Modern Painters, declares that Anibale Karachi was single-handedly responsible for the restoration of Roman painting after a period of almost unbelievable decline following the death of Raphael in 1520. This may seem excessive, but it pretty much also sums up the contemporary feeling about the Mannerist period, which lasts from around 1520 to the end of the 16th century. The whole decorative scheme was a showcase for the Karachi's revitalised classicism. That is, a return to the naturalism of high Renaissance art, and thus a rejection of the prevailing idiom of Mannerist painting with its non-naturalistic decoration and contortions. Certainly after the completion of the ceiling, Anibale was gifted a gold chain by Cardinal Aldo Brandini, with contemporary sources reporting that the Farnese Gallery was judged a wondrous thing, so that it now appears that Rome flourishes in painting again, no less than it did in times past. In its own time, and even now, it was a work comparable to Michelangelo's Sistine Ceiling, and of course Raphael's work in the Vatican Stanze, but in a new style that was to dominate painting for the next two centuries and would really herald in the beginning of the Baroque. Unlike Michelangelo's Sistine frescoes and Raphael's frescoes in the Vatican apartments, almost all of which deal with religious themes, the Farnese gallery decorations are mythological paintings dating back with stories to pagan antiquity. Anibale, in effect, adopts the heroic forms of the high Renaissance masters to what one critic has described as the procreative gamblings of the pagan gods. The universal theme that underpinned the entire ceiling was of course, amor vincit omnia, love conquers all, a message that is implicit and at times very explicit in every part of the vault. The vault does not consist of a single scene, but rather a collection of individual paintings or quadri riportati, that is, paintings that have been repositioned, transported paintings, with an illusionistic architectural framework known as quadratura, supported by Anudi, the nudes, putti, little cupid-like creatures, and herms surrounding a principal scene the triumph of Bacchus and Ariadne, which occupies the centre panel of the ceiling and which we'll return to shortly. Around this work, gods, demigods and mortals bow to the commands of love. Indeed, they allow their very nature to be transformed by it. Jupiter, the mighty sky god, is beguiled by the allurements of his wife, Juno. Hercules humbles himself before Aeoli. Chaste Diana is overcome by passion for the sleeping Endymion and Venus herself surrenders to love. In this magnificent ceiling, we witness the mighty fallen, the masculine made feminine, and the gods and heroes of antiquity made ridiculous by the power of love. The entire ceiling is held together by the simulated architectural scheme, which includes the famed antique Hermes, 
framing bronze medallions, depicting scenes such as Pan and Syrinx, uh, Apollo and Marseus and Europa and Zeus. And these take up the theme of violence, frustration and indeed even catastrophes brought about by the capricious nature of love. The feigned architecture is superimposed by real figures such as the flesh and blood ewes, the Anudi, that are of course reminiscent of those on Michelangelo's great Sistine ceiling. What Nibale had done was to revive for the first time in over 80 years the organisational and structural principles in which the greatest of all 16th century ceiling paintings is founded. Certainly, when one enters the Galleria Farnese, one is struck by a ceiling which rivals the Sistine in its inventiveness. We are presented with a collection of paintings, as I mentioned, quadri riportati, or transported paintings, set up above the corners so that they look as though they are sitting against and in front of antique medallions and framed by the herms. The herms, of course, are the column-like architectural elements with the head and torso of a man, which indeed seem to hold up as secondary corners. By placing these framed pictures in front of painted architecture, a nibbler suggests by illusionistic means that they are independent of the vault surface and with this technique he has, in essence, transformed the vault into a picture gallery. This in turn enhances the function of the area below, which was planned as a sculpture gallery. It was to be a showcase for the most famous examples of ancient statuary in the Farnese collections. No fewer than 16 statues, 10 full-length statues and 6 busts were to be placed in niches set in the two long walls of the gallery. The pilasters on the wall framing the niches determine the design of the rhythmical sequence of illusionistic architecture painted in the vault, a sequence defined primarily by the interaction of the giant herms, the stone figures. Indeed, the harmony of the room was actually enhanced by the fact that the herms were of the same scale as the statues displayed in the wall niches below. The medallions and the anudi supporting the narrative scenes openly declare his rivalry with Michelangelo. There are in fact 20 anudi, 20 nudes, the same number of nudes on Michelangelo's ceiling. Similar to the effect on the Sistine ceiling, the anudi seated on pedestals in front of the pictures animate the ceiling and provide it with a sense of depth as well as a unifying decorative scheme. Invested as they are with the same monumental grace as Michelangelo's aesthetic nudes, none of Anibale's anudi, however, repeat any of the poses of their prototypes. Michelangelo's anudi, of course, supported branches of oaks and sacks of acorns, which paid homage to his patron, Pope Julius II of the Della Rovere family. Here, the anudi support between them garland swags bursting with fruit, which reinforce the sexual content of Anibale's frescoes. Apparently, these were quite tame when compared to the garlands painted by Raphael for the nearby Villa Farnesina, which featured zucchinis and exploding pomegranates. No consideration of the Farnese gallery is complete without reference to the fresco cycles in the Farnesina, which were without doubt, along with the Sistine ceiling, paramount in Anibale's mind while he was at work in the gallery. The Villa Farnesina, which had been built and decorated for the banker Agostino Chigi before being acquired by the Farnese, lies directly across the Tiber from the Farnese Palace and is faced by its windows. At the time Annibale was working in the gallery, it overlooked an expansive garden which extended from the rear of the palace to the banks of the Tiber. It was the plan of the Farnese to span the river with a bridge which would reach from this garden to the Farnesina Gardens on the opposite bank making of the two areas a single complex. The influence of Raphael in Annibale's work is apparent throughout, especially in the Thetis born by a Triton painted by his brother Agostino, which is a more sensual variation of Raphael's Galatea in the Farnesina, as well as in the related panels of Polyphemus, who is not immune himself to the vagaries of love. Annibale, in his own treatment of the subject, uh, unlike Raphael, places both Polyphemus and Galatea in the same frame. In the Farnese ceiling, he devotes two end walls of the vault to this story and depicts Polyphemus in two opposing states, Polyphemo innamorato, Polyphemus in love, and Polyphemo furioso, the angry Polyphemus. They are the only two quadri in the vault that treat the same story and appear as a pair. 
Polyphemus is alternatively represented as gentle in singing of his love for Galatea, a nymph of the sea, and terrible in his rage of frustrated passion as he tries to kill his rival, Asus. In Polyphemo Innamorato, Anibale recreates an ancient painting described by Philostratus in the Imagines with such fidelity that a learned viewer might have imagined that this was the original painting itself, recovered from the past like the statues and displayed with them in the gallery. Anibale has been astonishingly literal here in following the ancient text and reproducing even the most minute gestures. I'll just read you a little bit from Philostratus' uh, text. Polyphemus, son of Poseidon, the fiercest of them lives here. He has a single eyebrow extending above his single eye and a broad nose astride his upper lip. He is painted a creature of the mountains, fearful to look at, tossing his hair which stands erect and is as dense as the foliage of a pine tree, showing a set of jagged teeth in his voracious jaw, shaggy all over, breast and belly and limbs even to the nails. He thinks because he is in love, that his glance is gentle, but it is wild and stealthy still, like that of the wild beast subdued under the force of necessity. Galatea herself sports on the peaceful sea, driving a team of four dolphins yoked together and working in harmony, and the maiden daughters of Triton, Galatea's servants, guide them, curbing them in if they try to do anything against the rain. She holds over her head against the wind a light scarf, to provide a shade for herself and a sail for her chariot. Her hair is not tossed by the breeze, for it is so moist that it is proof against the wind. And lo, her right elbow stands out and her white forearm is bent back, while she rests her fingers on her delicate shoulder and her arms are gently rounded and her breasts project. Polyphemus is spurned, however, by the object of his passions and his frustrated love explodes into fury and madness at the sight especially of, her, of his beloved in the arms of Essus and he hurls a rock torn from the side of Mount Etna at the fleeing lovers and Essus, struck by it, is transformed into the stream that bears his name. Together with Anibale's multiple allusions to Michelangelo and Raphael that I've already mentioned, he also references the art of antiquity. There are, of course, the fictive medallions with their green patina, looking as though they've been recently excavated after centuries in the earth, and the herms with their broken limbs evoking ancient works. But the clearest example of Anibale's appropriation of the Farnese marbles, however, is in the mighty body of Polifemo Furioso, in whose violent torsion we find mirrored the body of the famed Farnese Hercules, displayed in the courtyard just below and outside. Polyphemus and Asses is a tour de force of controlled pictorial violence. The huge cyclops who faces the spectator and leans forward as he prepares to pivot on his right foot is actually balanced by the very much smaller figure of Asus, who presents as he flees an almost perfect mirror image of the monster's back. The equilibrium is established on a diagonal in depth. The ceiling explores all manner and levels of love, passion and desire. Above these images of Polyphemo are smaller quadri which explore love between a god and a mortal, showing Jupiter in the guise of an eagle ravishing Ganymede and Apollo carrying his lover Hyacinth into the heavens. The story of Apollo and Hyacinth, of course, is a beautiful one. Um, Hyacinth, a mortal, and uh, Apollo became lovers. And uh, Apollo was teaching Hyacinth how to throw the discus and of course because Apollo was a mighty god his throw of the discus uh, he managed to hurl it quite a distance and um, Hyacinth in his enthusiasm ran after it to retrieve it for Apollo but it bounced off a rock and smashed Hyacinth on the temple thereby killing him. Apollo completely heartbroken of course um, gathered up his lover and took him up into the heavens thereby Apotheus Apotheosizing, I can never quite say that, making him into a immortal. Um, Raphael, of course, had also previously treated these same two subjects in his Farnesina. Certainly both Raphael's Farnesina and Anibale's Farnese could thus be considered not only as competitors, but also as pendants. And they are certainly pendants in spirit, as they are pendants in theme. On Anibale's, Anibale's ceiling, the theme is allegorically visualized in the very first medallion on the window wall. It is here that we see Cupid subduing Pan, 
And the meaning is clear when we consider the pun intended in the Greek translation of the name Pan. It means, of course, all or universal and Cupid, of course, representing love. So therefore, Cupid subduing Pan becomes love conquers all or love conquers the universal world. It is effectively an emblematization of the famous line from Virgil's 10th Eclogue, Omnia vincit amor. We know from this initial example that the rest of the medallions must be seen as emblems of the power of love of the universe and certainly they in the quadri riportati, the framed paintings, continues this theme through inventive and witty variations. The rest of the medallions all have to do with the dangers of passions once aroused. Along the wall from Cupid and Pan, we find the image of Pan's frustrated love of Syrinx, a nymph and follower of Diana. Known for her chastity, she was pursued by the lusty Pan and she ran to the river's edge and asked for assistance from the river nymphs. And in answer, she was transformed into hollow water reeds that made a haunting sound when the god's frustrated breath blew against them. Pan cut the reeds to fashion the first set of pan pipes. The next medallion deals with Leander's tragic love of Hero. Hero was a virgin priestess of Aphrodite at Sestos and at a festival was noticed by Leander who came from Abydos. They fell in love and of course Sestos being across the Hellespont from Abydos, Leander swam across this body of water each night guided by light from her tower. This was all well and good in the summer when the weather was fine, but by late autumn, the weather was turning nasty and one stormy night when it was quite windy, the light was extinguished and Leander halfway across drowned. Hero, seeing his body wash up ashore, threw herself from the tower and also drowned. On the wall opposite, the theme of love's power is continued with Europa and the bull, which illustrates Europa being carried across the sea by Jupiter in the form of a bull into which, of course, he transformed himself in order to seduce her. Through his passion, he carries the Phoenician princess Europa to Crete, and she gives birth to King Minos, the progenitor of the Minoan civilization. I particularly also love the grotesque or the mask at the bottom of this medallion, um, and I feel that he's actually holding his breath because he is both literally and metaphorically underwater in, um, and being underneath the medallion there. And it's these little witticisms that Anibale puts in that really livens up the ceiling. Along from Europa and the Bull, of course, is Apollo and Marseus. And the medallion depicts the unlucky Marseus, a satyr tied to a tree and being flayed alive by Apollo for daring to state that he could play the lyre better. It includes the pupil and lover of Marseus, Olympus, lying to the left of the tree, who wept so bitterly for the loss of his love that he was transformed into a stream. The plight of these two lovers, Marseus and Olympus, is mirrored by the longing gaze of the Nudo to the right of the medallion looking up at the Hearn, who in a similar pose to Marseus returns his gaze. Whilst the medallions announce the theme of the walls, the moral of the frescoes is actually stated in the corners of the vault. The concave curve of the vault result, uh, results in an awkward join from the painter's point of view at the corners of the ceiling, of course, but Anibale surpasses even this challenge. The corners are effectively removed from the rain main decorative structure and are treated as subsidiary ornamental or illusionistic fields. Here, the architecture parts to reveal cupids wrestling on a balustrade framed by the blue sky. These are the figures of Eros and Anteros who struggle to surpass each other in the demonstration of their passions. Read within the greater scheme of amor vincit omnia, they represent the struggle between love and love in return or love reciprocated. As eros, of course, stands for love, the love conceived by one person for another, and anteros stands for love returned, reciprocated by the original object. And of course, as there can be no losers in such a battle, the struggle is always equal. In the first corner, which is uh, here seen just to the bottom right, of uh, the slide, Eros and Anteros, love and reciprocal love, struggle over a palm of victory, symbolizing the contest between lovers to demonstrate to each other the strength of his or her affection. In the next, which unfortunately we can't see here, since victory in love is self-defeating, they've put the palm aside and embrace each other. 
The third corner shows us that the two are struggling again over a torch, indicative of the flames of physical passion. And in the fourth, seen here to lower left, they fight beneath a victory garland. These four groups of putti form the base of the entire conceit upon which the work depends, that of love and reciprocated love. The perspectival effect of these cupids is masterly, especially when you consider that an Ibele placed to either side of the adjacent wall, two herms who lean across the corners and embrace one another. Bellori in the 17th century marveled at them and how in a wonderful visual effect, they appeared neither to be sundered nor broken by the corners on the wall, but to reach across them with arms in relief and extended forward as though they were painted on a flat surface. Like the medallions, the herms are represented a l'antica. Anibale represented them as forms not entire and complete in themselves and with great wit has made sure that some of the Atlantes are, like the real antiquities displayed below, chipped and broken. The herms, however, are animated and seem to respond and comment upon the narratives which they frame. The entire supportive structure, in fact, is alive and we find that it becomes a sumptuous setting not only for the luxuriating and athletic and nudie, but also the frolicsome, real putty that abound. Putty peer down at the spectator to see if their antics are appreciated. Some are barely managing to hang on or are in perpetual danger of sliding off the medallions. Others converse with each other and point out into the real space of the gallery. One of them even disdainfully pees on the viewers below. The vault of the gallery, an ornamental setting for the display of art is itself a display and celebrates the power of art. The narration throughout remains light and playful in mood and sends the message through clearly that this wicked, wonderful love is indomitable. But what was the occasion that inspired the decoration of the Farnese Gallery? And why should a cardinal of the church have a room in his palace devoted to the celebration of profane love? It was, after all, a most unusual phenomenon in a city that prided itself on being the centre of Catholic counter-reformatory art. It should first of all be recognised that the Farnesian palace, although inhabited by Cardinal Eduardo, could not be considered his alone. It was the seat of the family in Rome, as much the possession of his brother, Duke Ranuccio, the head of the family, and it was to Ranuccio's children that the palace passed in lawful inheritance. This is attested to not only by the heraldic devices of Ranuccio and Eduardo in the, in the Farnese, but also by the clear intention of the brothers to decorate the walls of the Sala Grande with paintings illustrating the deeds of their noble ancestors. It was actually for this project that Anibale Caracci was hired in the first place and came to Rome in 1595. For some reason, the project was delayed and for the next two years, Anibale was occupied in the Camerino, a much smaller room painting a series of frescoes devoted to the intellectual and spiritual ambitions of the young Cardinal Eduardo. Then suddenly, the original scheme was abandoned and from 1597 to 1600, Anibale was working at feverish pace in the gallery on a project apparently unrelated to any celebration of Farnese history or ambition, but instead devoted to a celebration of the power of love. Why? And why at such a killing pace? If one looks up at the cornices of the uh, Farnese, there is a plaque bearing the date MDC in Roman numerals or 1600, which is placed on the cornice beneath the paintings. And it is more than probable that it was intended not only to commemorate the completion of the work, but perhaps more fittingly, when one takes into account the iconographical theme of the entire vault, the marriage in 1600 of Duke Ranuccio to Margherita Aldobrandini, the niece of Pope Clement VIII. It was the custom in antiquity to decorate the new home of the bride with paintings in celebration of her marriage. Such festive decoration would have accorded well with the wedding celebration, serving as a kind of epithalamium, a song or poem celebrating marriage. It is perhaps partly in response to this tradition that Anibale introduced the theme of recreated ancient paintings into his decorative program. In doing so, he would have had clear precedent. The theme of marriage certainly forms the basis of the four quadri di pinti minori, the four smaller paintings on the ceiling. The Jupiter and Juno, for example, 
casts a very satirical eye on the connubial relations, remark never remarkably cordial, of the king of heaven and his consort. Of all the ancient gods, Jupiter was the most notorious for his amorous weaknesses, often descending to earth in some form or another to seduce a nymph or a mortal. Indeed, one of the medallions, as we've already seen, uh, deals with his abduction and subsequent seduction of Europa, the Phoenician princess. In this quadro, however, Jupiter is seduced and deceived by his own wife, Juno, whom he has so often betrayed. The source for the painting is Homer's Iliad. Jupiter had forbidden the Olympian gods to interfere further in the Trojan War, with the result that the Trojans began to suffer heavy reversals to the, by the hands of the Greek forces. Finally, unable to bear the Trojan defeats any longer, Juno resolved to remove Jupiter from the scene so that the gods favouring the Trojans might help to avert the imminent defeat. She begged Venus to give me love and desire wherewith thou art wont to subdue all immortals and mortal men. And I'm very sure that the goddesses spoke like this in very florid Shakespearean prose, of course. Venus lent Juno, Juno her broidered zone, wherein were wrought all manner of allurements, love, dalliance and beguilement amongst them, that steal the wits of even the wisest. Essentially, it's the embroidered scarf which Juno wears tied beneath her breasts. Thus armed, Juno enticed Jupiter to the top of Mount Ida where she seduced him, and while Jupiter was thus diverted, the Trojans, with the assistance of the gods who were on their side, routed the Greek. This great reversal in the power base very nearly resulted in the destruction of the Greek fleet. In Anibale's painting, Jupiter gazes up at Juno with stupefied desire, drawing her onto his bed. The Lord of heaven and earth is about to topple backward onto his bed and gazes up towards an overwhelmingly dominant Juno. His eagle, who clutches the thunderbolt that has rolled under the bed, looks away, positively embarrassed at this ridiculous situation. The scene of such obvious deception is reacted to also by the grotesque or the mask below, who yawns in almost complete boredom at this routinely conjugal encounter. In this game of love, it seems that not even the goddess of love can escape love itself. Venus and Anchises, though not strictly speaking representing a marriage, nonetheless clearly alludes to the union, this time between a goddess and a mortal. Anchises, a young prince from Troy, was tending his cattle on Mount Ida, seen through the window in the background, and was so beautiful that even Venus could not resist him. She, who had all too often inflicted helpless love on the other gods, was struck with torment before her desire for a mortal. This was, of course, by Zeus's intervention. He had ordered Eros to fire one of the arrows at his own mother. And the seduction scene is actually attended to by Eros, who obviously looks a little guilty. He does, however, plant his foot on a golden footstool by the bed of the lovers, which is inscribed genus unde latinum. This is a quotation from Virgil's epic poem, the Aeneid, and translates as whence came the Latin people. The ensuing issue of Venus and Anchises' tryst was the noble Aeneas, who would travel from the fallen Troy via Carthage to become the founder of the Roman people. The fresco thus makes quite clear that the true origin of the Romans was not from the epic exploits of the noble Aeneas, but from a one-night stand. Contemporary viewers would have had little trouble in identifying and appreciating the wit behind this quotation from the opening lines of the Aeneid. The next panel, Diana and Endymion, iconographically lies across the same wall as the Jupiter and Juno, acting as a compositional pendant to it. And in comparing the two, we find that both pairs of lovers exactly mirror each other and form a right angled triangle with the head of the female at the apex of each. It in, in both, it is the female, of course, who has the upper hand. In the Endymion panel, we see the immutable laws of nature disrupted by love as Diana or, as sometimes she's referred to in this story, Selene, goddess of the moon, forsakes the heavens for her love of the mortal Endymion. She comes to Endymion so silently that even his dog is not alerted, and one of the two putty in the top corner urges the other to be silent, lest they wake the sleeping mortal. One of them even holds the fatal arrow that has struck Diana. 
Diana, caught in love's power, leans dotingly over the sleeping Endymion, so much the victim of mortal passion that she has abandoned her post in the sky. The Herms also react. The one to the left of the panel smiles to himself at the scene in which even the most chaste of goddesses is subjected to love. And Nibali has represented the grotesque below as an anthropomorphic wild beast, pointing to the fact that Diana, also being goddess of the hunt and having the power of the wild beasts, is completely unarmed by love itself. And in fact, the, uh, the home to the right also adds to that visual pun, of course, being armless. The subject of the fourth quadro, Minori, Hercules and Aeoli, was considered ridiculous even in antiquity. The story, taken from Ovid's Ars Amatoria, The Weapons of Love, is about Aeoli, queen of Maeonia in Lydia, with whom Hercules fell in love. She kept him in thrall for three years, while he ceased all virtuous deeds and gave himself over to effeminate pursuits, such as spinning and playing music, and exchanging his lion's skin and club for her gown. Hercules, the tamer of monsters, strikes a tambourine and turns towards Aeoli, who wears his lion skin, rakishly tying the paws between her breasts. In accordance with this tradition, Anibale has shown the great hero, masculinity incarnate, reduced to womanish languor. He whiles away his time in music and effeminate pursuits, indifferent to the calls of duty. Here is love victorious over the most powerful of men. It is precisely the victory of mocking love, whom Anibale has presented, surveying the scene with hilarious amusement. In the lodger, at the top left of the quadro, he laughs and points at Hercules, the powerful hero, now conquered by love. The story is, of course, a classic example of love's power to humble even the strongest. Apparently, an epithet had been inscribed on an ancient statue of Hercules by the famed sculptor Lysippus of classical Greece. He inscribed, Hercules, where is thy great club, thy Nemean cloak, thy quiver full of arrows, thy stern glower? Who was it that laid thee low? Why, winged love? This source was again invoked by the 17th century Italian poet Tasso, who wrote, Love, who was present, laughed to himself at Hercules, twined in a woman's gown. The marriage motif is further fortified by the meaning of the three paintings placed laterally across the centre of the gallery, the stories of Aurora and Cephalus, the Bacchus and Ariadne, and of the sea nymph, Thetis. Thetis, can be argued, represented the triumph of love in the air, or all three, rather, can be argued that these represented the triumph of love in the air, on the land, and over the water. And all three are definitely concerned with the theme of marriage. If we look at the, uh, the first panel, of Aurora and Cephalus. This fresco and the one opposite Thetis carried to the marriage bed of Peleus were actually by Anibale's brother, Agostino. They're the only two on the ceiling that are by Agostino completely. In 1600, soon after he'd completed these two frescoes, Agostino stormed off the job after an argument with Anibale, departing for Parma in order to paint a very similar vault in the Palazzo del Giardino for the Duke Ranuccio Farnese. The story, of course, exemplifies love's universal power, which can induce a disruption even in the rhythm of nature itself. Like Diana, goddess of the moon, who descended from her post in the heavens for the love of the mortal Endymion, Aurora, goddess of the dawn, infatuated with the mortal hunter Cephalus, neglects her duty. Her aged husband, Tithonus, a mortal for whom she had begged eternal life from Zeus, unfortunately, though, neglecting to ask for eternal youth as well, lies asleep, aided by the poppy-bearing Cupid above him. The poppy, of course, also signifying her own forgetfulness of both her husband and her job. Aurora's attention is solely focused on the reluctant Cephalus, who remains enamoured of his wife Procris and who she stuffs with little dignity into her chariot. The action is based on love's power and the havoc created in the universe by this power who by causing Aurora to fall in love with Cephalus makes her ne neglect her duty of leading Apollo and the sun across the morning sky thereby disrupting the orderly succession of night and day. The demonstration of love's power here is capricious and the dilemma was resolved only after all the gods including Zeus have acknowledged love's supremacy 
and induced Eros to restore order by causing Cephalus to reciprocate Aurora's love so that she may carry him off to the heavens. The panel across from this one is sometimes referred to as Venus carried off by a Triton or even a Galatea, but I think that as a Nibali had already framed paintings with these two as protagonists in the entire scheme of the ceiling, then he would not have repeated these in the grander scheme, of course. A lesser artist might have returned to the same characters, but Anibale and his brother, who painted this particular panel, were far more inventive. This is perhaps the most explicitly sensual of all the frescoes, as Thetis abandons herself to the triton who carries her off. Anibale's use of the Farnese marbles is again evident, in particular in the lewdly grasping triton that caricatures the famous portrait bust of the notoriously immoral Roman Emperor Caracalla, which of course was in the Farnese collection. Both Zeus and Poseidon were suitors of Thetis. So goes the story, the most famous of all the Nereids, the sea goddesses. However, it had been foretold that she would one day have a son that would far surpass the greatness of his father. Both gods, of course, gave up on their pursuit of the sea nymph and decided for their own safety, and the safety of all the other male gods, of course, they would marry her off to a mortal, the worthy Peleus, king of the Myrmidons. The wedding was attended by all the gods who came bearing suitable gifts, except for one, for Eris, or Strife, who, being a jealous and disagreeable goddess, was not invited. Despite this, she turned up and threw into the gathering the apple of discord, a golden apple inscribed for the fairest. The rivalries that this provoked led to the judgment of Paris and eventually to the Trojan War and the subsequent death of Thetis and Peleus's son, who was none other, of course, than Achilles. We must marvel also at the subtle balance of the two paintings on either side of the great Bacchus and Ariadne, one of which enhances the story of the apple of discord. On the crown of the vault on each side of the central picture, the gifts and snares through which love seduces gods and men are illustrated. Diana, come to earth to take the white wool preferred to her by Pan, then gives herself to him. Paris takes the golden apple from Mercury to give it in turn, after rejecting the political and military power offered to him by Juno and Minerva, to Venus. In composition, certainly, the downward plunge of Mercury was much admired in its day and would go on to influence a number of artists, including Caravaggio. I always like to think that it was influenced also by Tintoretto's work of um, the uh, miracle of the slave in the Scuola di San Marco, which I'm sure anybody would have seen on his trips to Venice. Mercury here, as I've mentioned, presents the apple of discord to the shepherd Paris, who is actually a prince of Troy. And this is the prize that will be awarded to the most beautiful goddess in the famous beauty contest amongst Juno, Minerva and Venus. Each of the goddesses promised Paris something valuable, but Paris chose Venus because she promised him essentially the most beautiful woman in the world as his bride, Helen of Sparta, thus triggering the Trojan War. In the Pan and Diana um, quadro, we see the downward movement of Mercury mirroring essentially the upward pose of Pan as he extends the gift of the white wool to the goddess Diana. And it is with this gift that he seduces her. Bellori, perhaps, said it best when he describes the Nibelé's work as bringing together poetry together with painting. He wrote, Love shows his power in subjecting the hearts of the strong, the chaste and the bestial, as appears in the amours of Hercules, Diana and Polyphemus. The embraces of Jupiter and Juno, Aurora and Cephalus, and Aurora and Thetis make manifest love's power through the universe. The white wool that Diana receives from Pan and the golden apple given to Paris by Mercury are the gifts by which love gains mastery and they illustrate the discords caused by beauty. Finally, the bacchanal symbols drunkenness as the mother of impure desires. And what a bacchanal it is. And Nibelé's ceiling culminates its centre stage in the great painting that dominates the vault. This is the Gran Quadro that represents not only the marriage triumph of Bacchus and Ariadne, but also the triumph of sensual love, lascivious and drunken. The Bacchus and Ariadne indeed became the most explicit statement of the iconographic scheme. 
Their story began not long before this riot has seen. Bacchus, on returning from a very uh, successful triumphal tour of India, as you do, discovered the crying Ariadne on the highland of Naxos, having been abandoned by her lover Theseus, who had sailed off with her sister. Typical. Despite the fact that this is a triumph with the action moving from left to right, it's also a very balanced and closed composition. Framed at upper left with an elephant and then across to the upper right with a tree, these two elements are linked by the spiralling putty across the top of the frame. Bacchus sits on his golden chariot drawn along by tigers, but he's drunken and glassy-eyed and in fact, he needs the assistance of a putto to support the arm which holds aloft a cluster of grapes. The frenzied maenades, the female followers and the satyrs, all the bacantes, express the fury and the madness that occupies spirits overcome by wine and they dance around him in wild abandon to the sound of horns, tambourines and cymbals. One can almost hear the cacophony. The recently awakened earthly Venus lies in the lower right-hand corner is indeed a framing device herself. Reclining on the ground, representing vulgar and earthly passion, she is exchanging glances with the drunken Salenus, Bacchus's ageing tutor, no longer able to support himself in riding a donkey. In the other corner, mirroring the earthly Venus, a satyr embraces a goat, representative of bestial love. And I hope you've all guessed who I actually am from today's lecture, especially in this uh, looking at the central panel here of the triumph of Bacchus and Ariadne. She is also being crowned by uh, one of the putti who spirals across the top. And basically he's crowning her with the stars of the constellation. And dare I say it, the constellation was named Corona. But from this moment on, she is immortalized. There is also another little putto at the centre of the frame and he's being trampled beneath the hooves of the goats and amid the cacophony of the bacante, no one hears his cries. This is a really representative of true and celestial love, the true and celestial love of Bacchus for Ariadne that is being overcome by earthly passion. There is a triumph here not of virtue and valour but of drunkenness and lasciviousness. It is this last major panel that casts the final satirical eye on the all too human love affairs of the greatest of gods and men. The Farnese Gallery was certainly a crucial turning point in the history of art at the turn of the century. It was here that the techniques of the new optical illusionism that had been developed by the Caracci in their academy, that is Anibale, his brother Agostino and their cousin Ludovico, as well an emblematized also the refinement of the decorative potential of an art founded in close analysis of the natural world and the human figure. Certainly, Anibale mastered the heroic forms of the high Renaissance and antiquity, but to these he added his own synthesis of the pure colours of the northern Italians, especially Correggio, Titian and Veronese. The vault of the Farnese Gallery was seen, not without reason, to have surpassed everything like it that had been made for more than half a century. It was seen to have, been, to have made an intelligent return to the best example that the past could offer and to have carried art indeed a step further toward a more ideal and perfect solution. The paintings of the vault, devoted as they are to the great epic theme of the triumph of love in the universe, bring it down to an earthly level. The tone of the works is mischievous and mocking. They seem to proclaim when love intervenes, even the grand designs of gods, the awesome might of heroes and the workings of nature itself come to naught. And should not we too as mortals then yield to love? The full line in Virgil's Eclogues reads, Omnia vincit amor e nos sedamos amori. Love conquers all, so let us too then yield to love. Well, wasn't Lorraine fabulous? And I hope you guessed what character she was from that painting. Well, this has been our first Art Appreciation Online, and I thank you very much for joining us.